Welcome back to the Social Kick Podcast. I'm Brian Lundquist, joined by a full crew, a fun crew tonight, Luke Baddington, Dr. John Mullen, Justin Wynn, and Dewey Draganya. What's up, Dewey? What's up? How you doing? Good, man. Uh, it's, it's good to talk to you. I've, uh, we've been in some races together, and um, a few, at least, in my career. A lot, a lot, yeah. First time to get to meet through the Friend Network, so fun to join you. Cheers, and uh, yeah, what are you drinking tonight? Uh, Paul Liner. Actually, but it's still in the fridge. I gotta grab it. <laughs> well, why the it in the fridge? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll get it right now. I'll get it right now. <laughs> That's the way to do it, Luke. What are you drinking tonight? I'm drinking a, a poor a lazy man's rum punch. I got some Haitian rum, which is not bad, slightly aged, but it's not so good straight. So I mix it with. So in Trinidad, you should squeeze limes and make a simple syrup and do a nice lime juice but i'm too lazy so i'm using a limeade with that rum you add some angostura bitters and i should be grating a nutmeg fresh rum but i am having grounded nutmeg so a poor man's rum punch john dewey brian you've all been at trinidad you've had rum punches and you know but that's what we do uh yeah the so sorry i gotta i got a bone to pick with angostura bitters because that i hate their packaging it sucks it's like 120 years old. It's it's from the Seagut family. Came across from Venezuela, but I yeah, that, it's I, annoying. I know that it's a thing. Now it's a now it's a distinct thing. But yeah, anyway. Yeah, it's annoying. See how it all signed up. But yeah. yeah. Hold on. John, what are you drinking tonight? I'm off to Scotch tonight. Just having a, a Guinness here. Oh, you must have an early morning. Mm. Well, so you you got so we're talking about um, the the beer the other day we we're talking about doing the beer mile and or the uh apparently there's a at the olympic club in san francisco a tradition to do the uh, beer 400 im and the way to win it is to drink guinness because it's not as carbonated and uh i don't know so maybe john if you got a fridge full of those keep a couple we'll go to the pool and we'll see what happens if everyone I, in this crew will do a 400 im drunk with me i will bring the guinness to see this crew do it because i would I need six guinness to smoke 400 IM. no no you need to be drunk to smoke 400 im you're crazy sorry you know, drink it beforehand and after <laughs> I, well, i'll bring enough to make sure that we get through it and we don't remember it because i'm not going to want to see either of you guys finish a 400 im that's for sure <laughs> well there's only one among us who actually can finish a 400 im so justin what are you drinking tonight well, I did swim the 400 in that conference. Um, I'm following you, Brian, Health Aid Kombucha. I always say I love the Health Aid Kombucha. I finally have one, but it's the <laughs> tropical punch flavor, not the watermelon flavor, which is probably my favorite flavor. Right on. All right. There you go. I do like that one. That's what do I, I, I should throw away my empties. I don't have a trash can in my garage. I'm like partially built this place. And so now I just have empty beer cans sitting around. So just, anyway. just a real quick question. Are you drinking a beer? After every fifty or twenty five or hundred in that four hundred, I am. I think it's. I think it's every hundred. Okay, that's a little bit better. <laughs> well, actually, I think it's before every hundred. So you chug one and then you start and then you finish with the high free. Yeah. So we did. Most did you ever swim at Aquatic Park? Did you ever go to the Aquatic Park and swim yeah, in that water? Yeah, we did, we did. We did one workout at Olympic Club. Uh, it's it's a really nice facility. It looks amazing, but. Uh, I, I know a lot of people that join there, but you know, since I'm not living there, it's uh, I haven't been in a long time. Well, I, think, I think you're like me. We both absolutely love the cold water. It's our favorite thing in the world, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like every every sprinter likes cold water, man. It's it's amazing. Do yeah, we have a ocean yesterday, uh, yesterday morning, we were hanging out with Cat Breed, uh, our friend from the pod, uh, and. She's this marathon ocean swimmer. So uh, I went to Santa Cruz and hopped in the ocean with her. And the way that she does it is no wetsuit. So I'm like, all right, no wetsuit. Got to do it. And she's like, oh, 30 minutes in. Yeah, we, kind of we, and you won't get any colder. I was actually the only guy on the team that didn't want to swim the Tiburon Mile. I got in a lot of trouble for it. But I just – I came there. And everybody started jumping in, and I was hanging out, and I just said, look, if I jump in, I'm going to get pneumonia. The season's over. I'm not going to do it. There's no way. <laughs> so I, I jumped in a boat and went back and never did it in my four years. I never did it every year. Like, where's that <laughs> sprint at? we got to get rid of this mile, right? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. That was that wasn't around when you never competed in Tiburon Sprint, did you? Mm -hmm. 
No, never. no that started in 2012, right after London. Yeah. Um, right. But yeah, Brian, what happened at the end of your race that warmed you up? I mean, your, your session yesterday. Something happened in your workout, in your swim yesterday. Yeah, what happened was I wussed out because I was 4,000 meters into an ocean swim and I was freezing my tail off. So I, I swam into shore and we had this uh, guy paddling with us and um, – and Kat was absolutely destroying me on the way out. She's so fast in open water. And uh, so she kind of took off on her own. It was probably a couple hundred meters away. Anyway, I cut into shore. And then Kat and the paddleboarder sink back up. And they've got maybe a few hundred meters to go. So it's probably five minutes after I got out or 10. And um, no, not even. And I see them coming into shore. I had already run up into the beach. And they get up there and they're, they're telling me a story going, the paddler looked over to his right, about five feet off. He sees a dorsal fin and flags Cat. Hey, Cat, stop. And Cat looks over, sees the, the shark over there. It was about a seven-foot great white. And she goes, what do I do? And he said, just paddle, go into shore, you know, swim into shore. And so they just turn and together go straight into shore. And sure enough, when we got into shore, I guess right after that, an hour later, they found the footage, uh, aerial drone shot of a shark that was spotted the day before in that same area. And that area is known for being really sharky, but uh, I never saw it. But who knows if that shark saw me? That's the crazy thing about swimming in the ocean is just you can't see anything. And yeah. I don't know. I, I actually, so I think about, we talked about shallow water blackout on here before. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the reasons why I've made it so far in doing breath holding work and, uh, you know, just pushing through hypoxic sets and stuff like that was I felt fearless and I felt like it was all in my head. And then eventually I had an incident in Trinidad where I did pass out. And from that moment on, I was constantly in the back of my mind going, okay, so there is a limit. And I actually think the same thing about open water swimming with sharks especially in the Pacific Ocean is, it's fine. Like, you know, I haven't died yet. And if you're going to go out, what a way to go out. You know, like I haven't seen any yet, but then then realize in a moment that they're actually there. And I hope that it doesn't just like play in my head next time I ocean swim. We'll see. Yeah, we hope it doesn't bite your head either. That wouldn't be good for the show. The ratings will drop. What's going on? This is the Memorial Brian Lundquist show. And uh, Luke, uh, what's your favorite Brian member? Exactly. <laughs> Do right, you've so had some epic spare fishing adventures. Any incidents, any dangers, any shadow of blackouts? I mean, I know you went some crazy stuff. Uh, I didn't. Some, I didn't. Richard yeah. Parkinson. You both know Richard Parkinson, who is insane. Yeah. <laughs> I, I did a little bit of spearfishing with George, but I, to be honest, I went hunting a few times also with a gun, but I never had that instinct to kill animals. Um, so I was mostly watching George get into trouble. <laughs> that, that was interesting. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I just saw, actually was hanging out with my wife and my kid the other day and saw a grizzly bear 20 meters away from us and noticed him like in the last second. Where were you? Uh, in Mo Montana, in the woods, like on some some lake, well, and so my speak of your son. <laughs> yeah. Well, so tell us what's going on now. Tell us what's going on uh, so yeah, I've been in U.S. since November. Started in Miami and drove drove across. He just fell off the bed, just so you know. That's why he's crying. Uh, so yeah, with a six month. Uh, old kid and uh we were driving around and uh we had the whole plan to do a two-year trip uh, me and my wife we've been doing eight years in a row six months or more per year all, all over the world we've been many places twice or three times what we like we like hiking a lot going to nature avoiding cities more and more and so we decided to do since he's so young to do north america and then to do central america and south america later but now with covid we, we're probably going to change our plans and uh we've been we've been doing the whole united states now it's about time to go to alaska it was we, we it was a plan to do uh canada but canada is closed up so uh, we're probably going to do alaska and, and drive down to california and fly back home Jeez, man. What, you seem like a young guy to be living the retired life. 
Uh, well, I'm not really retired. I, I've been retired, no, yeah, for for a few years and working in, in my own woods and and stuff like that. But then it was time to make some money, so uh, I I did what my wife been been doing her whole life. It's uh, it's uh, investments in uh, restaurants and hospitality business, and it's it's a good business, but it's just working 16 hours a day with a little kid. It was impossible, so we we sold some of our business and we rented some of our business, and uh, we said, listen, we we bought we bought ourselves some time, two years. Let's do on the road, uh, enjoy our life before the before kids starts you know going to school because then it's game over. Then you you're like in one place. Yeah, do you, what do you look for when you what do you look for when you travel? You come from a beautiful country, man. You come from the islands, Dalmatian yeah. coast, uh, thousands of islands, and you know crystal clear water and stuff, and you know super old history. What do you look for in the places that you go back to? The people, the culture, the serenity, the chill. What what is it that t brings you back? Uh, don't really care about people, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, we care more about animals and and uh, forest. Uh, my my wife loves beaches. She loves hanging on the beach, so we're looking for beaches. We've been everywhere in the world. So we spent the whole February in Hawaii. Uh, that was amazing. That was like third time that we've been in Hawaii. Uh, and just, I mean, hiking, Patagonia. We did Patagonia twice all over. Uh, did Torres del Paine, which is 10 10 day hike in the wilderness. Uh, you know, diff different stuff. So every, every trip has a different theme and different different goals uh we did explore asia but we're not looking back to go back yeah. there you know so we like we like central and south america the best and of course north but north is expensive and it's just hard so hard to be here you know yeah that's awesome i've been to torres del Paine, so it's um but man the <laughs> you're doing it right I think um, a lot of people don't have the courage to do something like that to to you know just say early in their career or early in their parenting life. I mean, you guys have to be really bold and confident people to say, you know what, we're taking control of our lives. We got a six month old. We're not gonna let that like yeah. let that be an excuse for why we can't go and do the things that we want to do and experience the world. Yeah, but look, it's it's hard. First of all, we lost a lot of friends because a lot of people don't understand, uh, mm. you know, mm. and people that do understand, they're jealous because they either have money or time, but none of them have both. So the, the, the art is to combine both in one because uh, if you don't have time, you're going to spend a lot of money, uh, yeah. you know, so and vice versa. So... Uh, Finding the middle, it's it, it's it's the, it's then the balance. That's the art of, of traveling, and um, it kind of it kind of grows under your skin after a while. You know, it, usually there's a crisis after six months. That's what we notice from uh, from our own experience and other travelers. Once you break the six month barrier, you can go for like three four years. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, it's you like get, growing a beard out. Yeah, you get to pass the itchy phase, and then it's fine. Yeah, <laughs> you know this. Yeah, do we? I was gonna ask, we talk about mental health in a show a lot, and you know, you saw at the elite level for countless years since you were a kid. Um, is there something that you you lost what in your swimming that you are enjoying getting back now? Uh, to be honest, that's like my last few years of swimming left a really bitter taste. Um, I, I have I swam maybe two kilometers since I quit. Yeah, uh, it, it happened. A lot of political stuff happened back home with my federation. I found out a lot of financial bad stuff happening. Now it's now there's a lot of accusations on the court, and the the, the things finally came out what happened to me, but. I kind of lost interest because I was disappointed in people. I was disappointed in FINA. I was disappointed in so many people that failed on dr drug tests that are swimming against me. Yeah. I mean, people that were beating me uh, I, all the time, now we see that they were drugged. And it's it's a huge disappointment in, in the sport. And, and I kind of lost that enjoyment of, you know, going to the pool and swimming. And that's that's the worst thing that happened to me. And, of course for every professional athlete when you when you quit you come to that depression phase and for me the the best thing i did was going to the woods to be uh, to be a woodcutter in my own yeah. forest to 
to be with animals. Both me and my wife, we did two years with no electricity, no running water, build our own house, you know, live with literally with bears and, and like foxes and and all that. And that 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 kind of that gave me a new perspective. I wasn't thinking about swimming, you know, I was thinking about life in general. So you 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 kind of start thinking, oh, swimming is nothing. It's it's not important, you know. What's important is you know nature and and good life and different stuff. So uh, so yeah, but I know a lot of people, especially in swimming, that once once the game is over, depression starts. Yeah, yeah. What? Okay. Go ahead, John. So when you meet people today, how long does it take for them to find out that you are a world champion swimmer? Usually, usually I never, I never mentioned that. Um, people usually can't even pronounce my name, so they they, they they can't even find out on Google who the who the hell am I, you know. So um, I I never talk about it. It doesn't really come up. I have tattoos. Sometimes when I'm when they see my tattoo, they ask me, "Oh, where did you go to Olympics?" Blah blah blah. But yeah. even then, I say, "Oh, I went to to Olympics," but and I never say, "Listen, I won a medal. I did this. I did that." It's 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 unimportant. I, I'm I'm passe. I'm I'm a history. It's it's behind us. There's new kids on. The, the blocks and they're famous you know i i knew that in back of my mind i always knew that okay i won a medal um news of the day is going to last for maybe three days yeah maybe they're going to talk about me for seven days but after that mm -hmm. it's over but do it that's not even when you swam and you were world champion that's when i first met you i think we're back in 06 or 07 and you, you would never tell it you're a swimmer you're a lanky kid you're tall and slim and you're laid back and you're chilled and I remember saying, and, and so my memories and my impression of my friendship of you was nothing about swimming. It was all about like going <laughs> to a techno nightclub. Or, yeah. uh, and, and, uh, but, but however, your agility and your athleticism came out on the way home when you were, I tell these guys this, you were leapfrogging um, parking meters on the way back. Because like, all of a sudden, this skinny, lanky kid could do amazing athletic achievements. But you, you, I don't define you as that. I define you as a yeah. guy who gives back to the world, and that's what's cool about it, I think. Uh, well, my approach to swimming was way different. So my my uh, strength and conditioning coach actually was coaching K1 athletes, if you know what K1. K1 was before UFC, before all this ultimate fighting. That was like karate and open fight in cages in, in Japan. It was like a $1 million fights happening there. Uh, so I did a lot of kickboxing, and what he did, he did a lot of motoric stuff. Like, I never met in my career, from all the people that I trained with, I never met anybody who had motoric capabilities like I did, because mm -hmm. that's all we did. That's all we did. People mm -hmm. were much stronger than me. People might have been talented, but motoric-wise, they couldn't do what I could, what I could you know. So that, that was one thing that really helped me out through, throughout our career. That was that was something different than anybody else did, you know. I'm gonna ask a dumb question. I don't know what that word is. Can you explain it? Motoric. Well, uh, motoric. I don't know how how do you say, but it's like uh, doing different exercises with your body to to be able to do anything in certain timing. So let's say you do five steps and then get your right right leg up and then you do five steps and do left leg up and then you throw in the legs you see a lot of that in basketball happening you know coordination it's basically coordination you coordinate mm -hmm. different body parts so they can interact with one another mm -hmm. and that's the biggest problem today when you see kids uh training uh they're so specific you got to be able to coordinate everything with everything on your body and that's that's the hardest part because that's something that we develop some by age of 16 and some by age of 18. after that it's game over what you develop you develop through your whole life so th this guy did that since we were like 13. that's all we did different exercises like just to to, to do coordination 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 all the time and it was it was good because at one stage I wasn't even swimming. I was preparing for a, for a kickboxing fight, and I I actually broke a junior record in fifty fly uh, without three months entering the pool. I didn't even warm up before the race. I just did kickboxing. <laughs> did you continue that to Cal? 
did you continue that with Mike? Or, mm, uh, or, well, Mike, Mike did a lot of boxing as well, but yeah. he did it for uh, he did it for uh, for core uh, yeah, because yeah, yeah. core and boxing and swimming it, it's exactly the same. But uh, but in the kickboxing, it's it's more about kicking than actually boxing. So yeah. it's more about leg work. Go ahead, John. Yeah. So obviously nowadays, like you were alluding to, you know, kids will swim or do one sport their whole life. We see it all the time at our clinic where they just don't have the ability to adapt or be, um, <laughs> I guess, uh, Luke bringing out his, uh, I don't know, special friend. What is that? Luke? <laughs> Hit it hard, Luke. Exactly. I got kids. I'll say. We'll, we'll fit you on the schedule tomorrow. For Sorry, John, go ahead. <laughs> so obviously we see kids specializing earlier and earlier and just doing one sport and not having any capabilities to, like you said, be rhythmic or being able to integrate their whole body. And then we hear from people like you and, and other swimmers that, like you said, didn't even swim for months and still break a record. Do you think that – how much of that do you think has to do with talent? How much do you think of that has to deal with – just you, you know, your ability to adapt on the fly and things like that. Well, I mean, if you want to be the best, and if you want to be on a podium, we've got to be able to adapt uh, real fast because because bad things are going to happen. You know, somebody's going to hit you on a warm up. You're not going to warm up as good or whatever. So you got to adapt all the time. But it, I, I was never the strongest guy. I mean, if you look any final that I swam, since I was in the first semifinals of the Olympics when I was 17 in Sydney, I was always the skinniest guy, always. So people were much stronger than me. I mean, I was strong in a weight room and certain exercises that I was really good, but I was not bulky. I didn't have that, that kilo strength that would get me off the block as fast so i had to get my speed from other other things and that was technique and timing and rhythm is the most important thing in swimming for me because if you pull your stroke and you don't time your hip or your kick it doesn't matter how hard you pull right because the water is going to stop you so there's technique and timing. That's for me. That's the most important stuff. You know, you can be a strong, the strongest man alive, but water is not going to forgive if you do anything wrong. Did you think, did you work on that with Mike and all the other coaches, or more yourself and consultative? Was it a team thing? Like, I mean, because um, Kavik talks about that in his butterfly. I think he talks about that, so he excelled in what he did in butterfly, and you're a great flyer as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Uh, I, I learned a lot from Mike. I mean, of course, Mike changed a lot of things because my coach back home when I was 17, 18, we were, experience, experience, he, we were experimenting a lot. Like when I came to Cal, I was swimming actually facing forward. What my coach did, I was wiggling a lot in freestyle. Mm -hmm. And to stop my wiggle, he made me swing with my head forward for a year. And it did stop stop me from wiggling, but you know it slowed me because I was pushing the water. But I I, I still was the the best junior time at the world at that time and everything. But huh. I came at Cal, and the first thing that Mike did is like said, "Put your head down, put your head down." You know that that's the biggest mistake you can make. And of course, Mike Mike was first of all the best psychological coach ever. Like if I went to anybody else and I was recruited by a lot of people. I would not make four years of college. There's no way. There's oh, no so. What do you mean? Listen, I was not the guy that showed up to every practice. <laughs> Let's put it that way. First thing first, I'm a lazy guy. <laughs> so if I feel bad and if my body tells me that I shouldn't go to workout, I'm not yeah. going to go to workout. Mm -hmm. And not a lot of coaches would allow that. No. What's the story I heard about you and Mike? at three o'clock in the morning at the dance floor and continue that story. What, what tell me that story? Well, that, that's, that's the best story. So first of all, Mike always had a stopwatch, right? And we, we go, we go to, uh, to the World Cup in Canada and I swam, I swam really bad. Like we came out of training and nothing, I wasn't supposed to swim good either way. So we go back and we're sleeping together in the room and we go back to the room and he's like probably after dinner, 11 p.m. And he's like, what are we going to do now? We got to wake up tomorrow at 7, do a workout. And I'm like, Mike, I'm so tired. I just swam like this afternoon. And I was like, 
I don't want to, I don't want to do a workout. And he's like, all right, I'll make you a deal. Let's go to a dry bar and you dance for an hour. And I'm like, you're kidding me, right? He's like, no, no, let's go dance together. So he made me go to a techno dry bar and we're dancing for an hour with him on the stopwatch. And that was my workout. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's he's just one of those guys that, like you know psychologically he was getting out of us the best and you can see that in anthony's year in a lot of guys that's from Macau. you know it was just we're doing every day not every day but monday wednesday friday we had like sessions that were just minds just mind entering your mind visualization meditation you know all that and that benefited all of us not only for swimming but for you know for everything in life for exam for whatever we were calm and we you know we were never champions we never had that 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 team thing but i mean we were champions in relay pretty much every year since since what 2001 yeah i know okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah I was, on, I was on one they got beat Hey, what do you think it? What do you think it is about um, your upbringing? I actually find that, in my experience, it was a lot of the international guys that were on our team who knew what they needed or were willing to stand up to the coaching staff and say, "You know what? Like, now I'm not into that rite of passage stuff or whatever." Um, and I'm just curious if it was something. But I mean, I think I think there's two things happening. One is. You, you didn't grow up in the American culture of I got to swim at Texas or I got to swim at Cal and I'm going to go there and do everything to be there because I idolize these programs. Right. And that's the way that a lot of people that came to Auburn were as well. And I think, um, you know, but the international folks didn't have that, but also the elite uh, swimmers that I was around had an intuitive, uh, you know, they're very in touch with their body and their needs uh, the, spe the specificity to which they want to apply that to their training. And you seem like you are very in tune with that and knowing exactly what worked for you. Do you think that that was part of your training, your upbringing, your, your parents? Where do you think you, that you got that? No, actually, I was always pushed to do 200 because of my stroke and my body. Everybody thought that I'm always mm -hmm. going to do 200. And I, I always used to say everything above, above 100 meters I take my motorcycle, all right? I'm not swimming at about 100 meters. No way. Because I've seen from a young age, you know, people that swim 200, 400, 1,500, they do, like, this crazy work, and I'm just not going to do it. So give me 50, give me 100. That's, that's, where, that's where the fame is. That's where the speed is. That's where the, the weight is. That's, the, you know, the strength is. So uh, that, that was always kind of appealing to me, 50 and 100. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's also a cultural thing. Listen, I, I mean, I, I come from a city that has the most Olympic medals per capita. Croatians are really specific people. They, they don't really buy into fame or, or success or anything, you know? So... Split is, is my hometown, and uh, we, we have a saying in Split. If you're a champion of the street, you're nobody. If you're a champion of the, of the country, you're nobody. If you're a champion of, of, of Europe, you're nobody. If you're a champion of the world, uh, you're somebody. But, you know, if I train for a few days, I'll probably beat you. So that mentality kind of pushes all of us forward because you're, you're never going to be recognized. You're never going to be you know somebody until you defeat everybody and then still somebody's gonna come and say oh you're nobody <laughs> what what are some of the other sports that kids got involved in though all right where, where they were World Cup, man i was i was rooting for you yeah i mean we have basketball players you know tony kukoc from right. uh from chicago bulls he's from split dino raja celtics uh uh, tennis players, Goran Ivanishevich. We're all, we're all like in a few mile radius. It's it's a small town. So Modric, we, well, Modric, Modric is the other city. He's but a we, small kid, though. <laughs> yeah, but we are, we also have some good soccer players uh, from my ho from hometown and track and field, uh, taekwondo, name it. We have Olympic medals from a lot of sports. Water polo. Uh, water polo, of course. Water polo. Yeah. yeah. Handball and, handball and water polo are kind of national sports yeah. after soccer. 
handball. What uh, it makes you wonder, you know, if there's any other things. I mean, truthfully, genetically or uh, diet-wise, lineage, you know, that leads to breeding athletes from, you know, the city in Croatia. No, of course, there's Mediterranean cuisine is, they say, one of the best cuisines for uh, for lean body and for, for health, you know, olive oil. We, we have a lot of oil, uh, olives. So fish, olive oil, uh, lamb, you know, stuff like that. And uh, we still up recently we haven't had so much like pesticides and so much like this advanced <laughs> culture like you guys have here so uh and of course we you know our parents get us drunk when we were six or nine so we don't really care about alcohol in college so <laughs> right yeah yes yeah, okay. go ahead what's your diet like when you when you swam what's it like now i know you're a big healthy man what, what, what do you have a diet that you cared about and what's it like now uh, excuse me, I didn't hear it. Your diet. What, what's your diet uh, like when you swam and what's it like now? You, I mean, you're, you're yeah. into yoga, you're, you know, you're conscious about your body. Yeah, I, I change actually a lot of my diet because uh, of my wife. She likes raw cuisine mostly, so uh, and she's a great cook. And we did, we had our own business that we did a lot of raw uh, stuff on, on, hmm. and gluten-free and stuff like that. So I, I still mix it up, but I kind of lean towards that stuff more and more because I feel way better than eating, you know, bad stuff. So. Is there anything that you've changed a lot though since your swimming days uh, to move into life post swimming? I mean, I guess like what's any changes to your diet and like what do you do to stay fit? Uh, I don't, I don't train much. I used to when I when I was at home, I used to play basketball. That was that was the only sport I did. Uh, but I do when I do train, I run a lot, and uh, that I've been running my whole life. We've been actually. Since I was 10, we did three runs per day and we had certain timing in, in running. Like we did sets like eight times eight minutes with a minute of rest, uh, different different pulses, you know, uh, heart rates and whatever. So running's been my life uh, with, throughout swimming career. I always was a runner. Oh, even uh, your swimming career, you were running. Yeah, yeah, not not a not a college so much because they just didn't do it because people would get injured that were not runners. But uh, yeah, I, I used to a lot of run, run a lot, and actually I learned from uh, Alexander Popov that he he actually used to uh, walk a lot. He would walk for three to six hours per day. Think about it. Oh, yeah, he How? would he he would be done with the, with the workout, and then he would go for like three hour walk, and he would he would measure his heart rate. And he said that that he said that that helped a lot in, in his swimming. Wow, that's that's a very different approach than you hear a lot of modern day swimmers. It's a lot about spending time in the weight room, uh, doing you know dynamic movements, etc. Of course, a lot of people are talking about the difference between, uh, you know, I guess the fine line between strength and speed and fast twitch and staying light and having good technique and body position, but uh people running is not anything that i've that i've heard um, hey john yeah. why did it work you think why did it walking work and and all that was it just no i mean i think obviously like uh like we're hearing technique especially for the sprint events is huge right and if you start doing all this extra yard the technique is usually going to fall apart so if you're looking for some sort of slow steady state cardio like jogging walking, things like that might be able to keep you in enough aerobic shape for a 50 or 100, 100 meter in the pool. So I do think those are some potential ways, especially the walking, as crazy as it sounds, you know, talk about a way to not hurt yourself and still get your heart rate up and get some cardio in. Right. Yeah. The good thing is that I was brought up by this coach that he was actually a lot of coaches in different sports in Croatia do this. Now you see like Tony Kukoc, who I, who I mentioned the player Chicago Bulls. He was the only player, I think in the history of NBA that could play all five positions. Think about it in basketball. And that's not something that he, you know, learned in the United States. That's something that he learned when he was 14. Yeah. Same stuff with us. Like we would never do a lot of freestyle. We would do a lot of IM just because, you know, our, our, coach and from young age he said if i push them in one way or one stroke they're gonna screw up their shoulders their knees whatever 
So let's push IM. Let's push IM. And uh, I, I, I took, uh, you know, 100 IM, uh, European champion, 20, what, what, 28. I did it for first time in my life, and I was European champion just because I had that base. I had that. I could do breaststroke. I could do freestyle. I could do backstroke. I could do fly. You know, I, I was the best in freestyle, but, but still that came from a young age that's that's something you cannot do when you're 20. you got to do that when you're 13 12 you know mm -hmm. develop develop that coordination sure. that, that that you can do all that what do you think that you did really well that made you so fast i never met anybody that could kick as fast as i can oh i know that why wow. yeah. That about you, like like what? Any set, whatever. Twenty fifties kicking, you know, whatever, whatever. What? I was not good. I was not fast underwater, but give me give me a board and let's kick freestyle. Yeah. Get out of here. So, do you remember any any sets that you might do, or just like an example of how fast you could do a hundred kick or something? No, I don't. I don't remember, but I, I remember I was really really fast, and my kicking was always. I remember my dad saying well, since I was like six years old that all, all, all the boats have the engine in the back and that kind of pushed me always. I don't know why, but I was always kicking fast. <laughs> who, is the, who is the fastest of you guys know who is the worst kicker that you trained with, you know, who are like, who could not kick at all, but this guy could get up and sprint. Was anybody you guys think of? Uh, I think all the distance swimmers can kick. <laughs> Every distance swimmer. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, in today's world, Zane Grothy was a ridiculously good kicker. Um, who's, I mean, relevant in, you know, in the U S and he's been one of the top distance swimmers there. Uh, the fastest guy I ever saw with a board was Simon Burnett. Um, yeah, and I know is in Arizona lore for how fast he was, uh, kicking with a board, but yeah, huh. I didn't know that about you. What about, what about starting? What made you a good starter? Uh, the reaction and entrance to the water. I had this entrance that I would use my my legs when entering for the first kick. And as I was really bad kicker underwater for like fly kicking, I would go out as fast as I can. I actually learned that from Tony because Tony was also a bad fly kicker and he would just go in and go out as soon as, 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 soon as he went. So, yeah. <laughs> I remember the first time I saw Tony swim. It was at 2002 NCAAs, and you were, you were there. Um, it was in uh, Athens, Georgia, uh, and Tony was going head to head with um, with Roland Schumann. Uh and they both went 19 zeros. Uh, I think Roland won the individual 50, but Tony broke out. His head cleared the surface of the water before the flags. I knew I knew who he was before going in. Whoa. Like, I don't know how he did that and didn't just get mowed down by the wave, but yeah. somehow he navigated it. Roland, Roland was a good kicker also and a good starter. But when I trained with him, he he couldn't beat any of us. And then he left and then he beat all of us. Yeah. <laughs> what 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 did you do well when you broke the world record in the, in Wills? Was it was they all came together? You call, you call it one of your, your perfect races. Uh, you know, outside lane, right mindset, right set. What 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 nailed? What happened? Uh, well, first I had a good Europeans before that and we're debating, should I go to Worlds or prepare for Olympics? And my, my national team was pushing me to do, to do the Worlds also. So I came fit. I was, I was ready. Um, and I knew that, that I'll, I'll, I'll be fighting with Foster for first place. And yeah. I was aiming, I was basically taking his strategy since I met him. Cause I, I talked, he was doing like two meets per year in Croatia every year since I was a kid. And I learned a lot from him. Uh, not training wise, because huh. he was not training, but just approach to, to, to the race. Huh. And he was always aiming for, for lane one or, or lane eight for some reason. And uh, since I was so skinny and didn't have weight, uh, the only way for me to win the race, 50, not 100, but 50, was to be in the outside lane. I could never, especially short course, I could never win in the middle because the waves on the turn would kill me. Hmm. I wanted so, to ask you because, well, sorry, go ahead, finish your thought. Yeah, 
So, so I was aiming for either eight or or one. or one yeah. for outside lane, and I hit a pretty good start. Yep. Nothing, nothing special, but a good start. Uh, but I hit excellent turn, excellent yeah. turn. And once once I cleared the turn and realized there's no wave in front of me, because if you look at that race, you're gonna see that the wave in the pool was on the other side of the pool. It was like Brian. Reason. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's for sure. I, I think because, it. Yeah, because all the heavy guys were on that side of the pool and the, the wave just stuck with them. And I was I was clean. It was probably one of the cleanest turns that I ever did. And I just once I did that, I knew I knew there's no way anybody's gonna beat me. I just just kept on rolling to the end. And the world record kind of surprised me, but I, I wasn't surprised after the turn that I was first. Because it was so clean, I never, I never had that. That the wave did not hit me whatsoever. How many uh, finals did you? Go ahead, Jared. I was gonna say, how many times did you miss finals because you were trying to be, you know, perfect with getting one of those outside lanes? <laughs> the the worst, the worst was Beijing. I, I screwed up Beijing because I was aiming for for that in semis and ended up. 10th or 11th. And actually, Eamon Sullivan really screwed me because he was doing the same thing like me. And I thought he was, he broke a world record that year. So I thought he's going to go out and show everybody. And I was like basing, base, he was next to me and basing from him. I was, you know, like trying to, to kind of go for a certain time and certain place. And that kind of screwed me. Fun fact you both knocked George out. George was ninth in the Manchester World semis. So he just missed finals, you guys. Oh, really? Yeah, he told me that today. Yeah, I saw that. When I was looking at the results. Yeah, I didn't know that. So, yeah, if you're, hmm, so you would consciously swim a fifty long course in the Olympics and have an awareness of where your competitors are and like try yeah. to. Back? Yeah, not not in two of not in two thousand four. I was just really tired from Hunter Fly because Hunter Fly. I'm actually one of, I think only me and Matt Biondi did like uh, Hunter Free, Hunter Fly, and and Fifty Free Finals because it's it's so hard with schedule. Yeah. And and Mike was Mike was actually convinced that I'll I'll uh, I'll get on a podium in Hunter Fly because I was ready for Fly that year. But I got I got a cramp in the last 15 meters of Hunter Fly in finals, and that just destroyed me. And then I I just went. I just went in that 53 finals with open mind and I said, oh, this is my last race. I'm just going to do the best, whatever. I was so tired. I was like half an hour, not even 30 minutes in between. And what really saved me was the fact that I came into the uh, pre-exit room last. And I, when I got in there, the atmosphere was like, whoa, like really bad. You know how it how it gets, especially fifty three with all yeah. these big guys eyeing each other and it's just nervousness. Who's gonna break first? And well, actually, I learned I learned a lot from Popoff in, in that sense because he would he would always come before semis and finals. He would he would enter the room and say, "Hello, gentlemen, how are we doing today?" And that's all he said. He would sit down and he's like, "Hello, gentlemen." <laughs> <laughs> own it would sound like that's yeah, a good thing to do <laughs> be like the, the champ is here <laughs> yeah yeah a lot of those races were won ahead of time for if you ask me and uh, actually a, a lot of any any sports are won ahead of time if you if you look at the at the fighters you know boxing champions if you look when they go out you can see it in the eyes right away most of the time not all the time but most of the time what did Gary tell you in that ready room? Because you and Gary are good friends. What did he tell you? Nothing. He was he was in in his own state of mind. I mean, you, you don't really talk before no. fifty three no. final. Yeah. He's just like, yeah. Were you afraid of that your cramp would come back? I mean, are you just like, oh, I can't? Yeah, work. yeah, yeah. My physio was working like crazy, and it's like it was yeah. really, really, really bad. But. You know, you, you jump in, and I, I had actually pretty pretty sweet start. I also had a good lane. Uh, hit hit a pretty sweet start. Uh, so yeah, it, it was a good race that long course. I also had a great race in uh, in uh, Canada, Montreal. Year afterwards, when, yeah, 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 Roland beat me. 
Yeah, we're rolling. Yeah. yeah. That that's actually when the, the thing with my federation start falling apart. I like I had so so bad things, so many bad things happening on that world that it's just crazy. I don't want to even talk about it. But, but yeah. When when do you, what's the margin of error for touchpad registering the time? Three one hundreds. Do you think that there's some bias involved in the in the in the in the record in the recording of it? I mean, hell yeah, hell yeah. Beyondy lost the Spitz run with Nesty right by 01 in '88. Um, did it start before then? Like, how many swimmers lost by 01 before that? I don't know. But after we had a lot, right? Yourself. Yeah, the, the worst thing that I've seen was Marcus Rogan and Aaron Pearsall, who I love. I love Aaron. Aaron is a really cool guy. But at Olympics 2004, uh, it was it was something that something that happened that was like he was DQ'd or it was a one one hundred difference, and Rogan was already celebrating, and there comes Schubert, right. goes in. American team puts in red flag, whatever they, you know, right. and suddenly Aaron is first. Yeah, you know, yeah. And, and and if you if you look at the ratio, yeah. Americans rarely lose by one one hundred, and yeah. that sucks. That one was one hundred. That one was a pretty good margin, but it was because they called him for. Um, I think it was like picking on the side, or no, it was the extended turn. Yeah. So that I think he was still moving his legs. Yeah. He turned over onto his stomach and turned. Yeah, yeah, and and actually, my head coach in 2004, after I was second by one 100, he comes up to me and he's like, "Are we gonna complain?" Because he thought like, "Hey, let's go, let's complain." And I yeah. said like, "Dude, he's American. There's no way. Just don't do it." Wow. So so yeah. we didn't we didn't even complain. Uh, but yeah, there's a uh, three 100s. The the touch pads cannot do three 100s, and so what, whenever you see somebody losing by one 100. It's, it's not. It's not really losing. It's, so, it's 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 equal. I I can name like two or three more examples of that Olympic finals and friends of ours. Um, mm -hmm. But but th th if we can move beyond that, and what can we do to? And you talked about you know the the rampant doping um, in the sports and there's a bias and you know you're not American. Um, what can we do to to continue to level to help the the sport of swimming get back to the love of spring to 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 help. To help, um, you know, countries have political biasness against their own athletes, stopping them from going to the games. To 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 help the small countries continue to do well against the big countries that really influence FINA. To help the drug, to help the people who to fight against the drug cheats. We have WADA, but it's not really working. What needs to happen to our sport to, to 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 make it what it should be? Just a freaking you and me. Let's get up and go, clean race. What needs to happen, really? Well, but it, it's a political thing. It's the same thing that happens in WADA or Olympic committee happens in the UN or wherever you look at. So money, yeah. Yeah, uh, money turns around. If yeah. if if American TV is gonna pay for swimming, they prove that they can do with swimming whatever they want. If they want finals at 10 p.m., it's gonna be 10 p.m. If they want finals in the morning, it's gonna Absolutely. be in the morning. Absolutely. So it's not about swimming anymore. Yeah. Uh, it's not about swimmers. It's not about you and me. It's not about who's gonna be first. It's about who's gonna make money. So Doping wise, first of all, why are only Americans allowed to test Americans? Why are only Russians testing Russians or Chinese Chinese? You know, Good why point. am I why am I getting tested 19 times in one summer, and then I'm competing against the guy that that uh, knows when is when is he going to get tested? He knows exactly when the tester is going to come, and I get tested at 6 a.m. like 19 times in three months. Yeah. So it's it's I, I don't think it's possible. I think the best thing would be to do the NBA thing, allow it. You know, who, who wants to do it does it. Who right. doesn't want to do it doesn't. Hmm. But uh, but it, it's 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 hard. I mean, I swam against so many big superstars that today were tested positive, and. Uh, what what am I what am I to say my kid tomorrow if he wants to do if he wants to compete? Am I gonna say take it or be an idiot and look everybody beating you and you're not taking it? So it's 
I, I, I don't I don't know. I don't know. It's, is it cheating if it's not banned yet? And I say it. I'm not only talking about drugs. I'm talking about you know advances in the sport. We saw you know the underwater fly kicks. We saw you know the in breaststroke. We saw the suits. We saw. Is it cheating if it's not yet banned? If they've bent the rules? Hell yeah. I mean, look at look at uh, what is it Thorpe with the suit? Yeah. <laughs> That's the biggest con. The life raft. This is the biggest con ever. Man, somebody told me this week that uh, they thought that there's there's a theory that Thorpe could have been faster in a different suit. And I'm like, I mean, I remember hearing people talk about that suit floating. So, yeah. I don't know. I think in floaty suits. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't I don't know what to tell you, but it, it's it's really for somebody to come like me and George or Kavik to come from let's say third world country in swimming yeah. and to to win a medal. It's it's worth much more than coming from Russia or China or United States or Australia. I mean, I was I was lucky when I had heated pool. You know? But to, you know, talk about that because you guys have a, a camaraderie. Uh, I, um, I know, like Jason Dunford, George, they they call it about the third world team. I mean, all you guys who are known from the superpowers, you guys get together. Yerney Dunford, I mean. Talk about that camaraderie and, and what it feels like to be outside the U.S. system, outside the Aussie system. Well, I mean, it's just, it's just harder to succeed. It's right. it's way it's way harder for somebody from outside to kind of come and defeat somebody from a U.S. team or somebody from Australian team. Because look at Australian team. I mean, in Australia, they have a rule that one coach comes for four people. Think about it, or three, four, wow. three or four. And where I come from, we have one coach that coaches all age mm -hmm. groups and everybody. Yeah. yeah. And there's usually 10, 15 of us in a lane. We don't have our own side of the lane. We were, you know. So it's right there, it's unfair. Then we can talk about other stuff. What kind of hotels we sleep in at and what kind of hotels they're sleeping at. What kind of transportation we have? What kind of transportation they have? What kind of drug testing they have? What kind of drug testing we have? So, so how do you that I mean, it doesn't go back to the athlete. It's not the Aussie swimmer's fault. It's it goes back. It's not necessarily. No, no, of course, of course, is is the system. Is is, is, the, is the system? That's why I'm saying it's it's yeah. much harder to come from outside because let's say that for my Olympic trip, uh, the Croatian Olympic Committee invested in me roughly 20 grand how much did olympic committee invest in a u.s woman right or in russian swimmer or brazilian swimmer i did not have a doctor yeah you know i i did not have my personal doctor who's gonna go with me to drug testing or who's gonna control my levels or whatsoever or you know so it, it's 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 just different it's com completely different game and it, it's from that standpoint, it's also unfair, but that's what makes sports interesting. And that's what, when, when Croatia wins this, this, the silver medal in, in okay. soccer, yeah. so, world soccer, that's why everybody's cheering for Croatia, the rest of the world, because mm -hmm. they know what French team is. Yeah. French team is, is, is amazing. It's, it's you know, the, the level of, uh, of approach in sports in France is one of the best in the world right now. What so your time at Cal? I mean, you you, you tell a story about Nort. I mean, the, the the most legendary coach Nort Thornton. What he told you your time at Cal, and then your time being a pro afterwards. Compared to two periods in your and how you felt. You well, know? I mean, being a pro is it's way dif different. You know, you have all the stress from like sponsors. Are you going to make money? Are you going to? You know, I left. The, my biggest probably mistake was leaving California, but I left California just because I I could not afford it. Yeah. You know, so. Uh, and I went home and the thing unraveled back home with, uh, with uh, you know, money and everything. But, um, you know, coming, from, coming to Cal, coming to organized team, it was a shock. Uh, coming from Croatia, from a small city, from a small team to something that is so organized that you have your physio, you have your uh, mental coach, you have your, your advisor, you know, it's, it's crazy. It's something that you can't even imagine coming from Croatia that you're ever going to have. 
So um, that really changed my perspective and my game. And that's why I got so pissed off at people back home because they never got even close with professionalism to what I experienced at Cal. Because in Croatian team at Olympics, you would come to the, the house where I slept and people who work for Olympic Committee would smoke and drink till 2 a.m., you know? You think that that would happen in any like any other serious team? No, that's and then I would get pissed off and I, I would start yelling on them and everybody would look at me like, you know, you're crazy. What are you talking about? That's normal. For them, it's normal, but for somebody from coming from U.S. and from different system, it's it's, it's an unimaginable that somebody would do that. Yeah. Do it. How did you achieve so much so early, man? Because like, tomorrow we have a, a, a guest coming on, Leah Martindale. She came fifth for the finals. Um, she's from Barbados. You know Trinidad. Barbados is a quarter of the size. They yeah. were a pool. She didn't have a pool and she was just 12. You know yeah. what? Like, you had a pool only for what, six months of the year when you were a kid? Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. How, but how the heck did you get past all that? Was it just, what is it? How do you guys excel and become world beaters, man? Can you imagine you uh, you just innovate you do if if the the water if the the, the water is cold you go running if, if 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 there's no heating for a week are you not gonna swim for a week okay you're not gonna swim but you, okay go run go go do other stuff go go work on something else so yeah, yeah. Uh, you you gotta you gotta innovate all the time you gotta you gotta think out of the box because I imagine like a kid today in the United States that he needs to go to a championships in, a, in three months that is going to either push him to a college that he wants to do or not. And suddenly there's no electricity for seven days in his, his, his pool and he cannot go on a workout. He's going to freak out, right? <laughs> for us, it's just one, one more day in the office. It's a normal thing. Okay, let's do something else. We had um so you swam at my home pool. Justin, if you bring out that picture, the picture of Dewey doing a clinic back in Trinidad. So that was a pool I, I grew up in. That pool was always green, not cloudy. Yeah, same like ours. Same like ours. Yeah. We didn't have lane ropes. We had no not that that, that that's a nice pool. This is the other one. Yeah. yeah. So, so it, it we had lane ropes like these and so yeah, I mean, actual we, rope. we didn't yeah. care. It was literally rope. But when we went to nice pools, we're like, oh, wow, this is like riding a bike. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, there, well, that, no, not, no, that's yeah. Uganda. That's Uganda. That's Uganda, yeah. But there's a, there's a saying, you know, uh, when, when the pro fighters, boxing fighters, they, when they lose uh, the title, when they start training in a nice facility. <sighs> well, I think we're seeing that here right now where yeah. COVID going on, I, we hear it from my, my wife's a coach. We have swimmers saying, oh, I can't be in the water for two months. What are we going to do? The season's ruined or we can only swim an hour at a time a few times a week. They're really having a tough time with these adaptations and being able to adapt like what you said. Growing up in it, you, you learn how to deal with it and, and move along. Yeah, exactly. And and as, as Luke said, when once you get – that perfect condition conditions you're like wow i'm flying it's crazy this is crazy you know so i i, I don't know it, it's just sometimes it's better not to have than have you know it just it makes you hungry tell us a funny story of of what might have happened was there ncs when when your, your goggles ripped your suit ripped or somebody happened and you're like oh whatever i'll just do it is there a time you swam no goggles is this time that you i mean i know the time you slipped off the blocks of your start and you learn from that on a relay yeah, yeah. was there yeah. was there something you like you know what you know what i'm gonna learn from that i'm just gonna make myself better talk about oh, it. of course of course i mean i slipped on my first relay and in the first finals of ncs were supposed to break the record and uh four by one and I was I was leading off as a freshman, and I slipped. And since then, I got my start way better. And I was always leading off. I just I wanted it. I never I never went last. I never wanted to be that guy that win, wins the gold for the team. I always wanted to be that guy to give fresh water for my teammates. So I always went first. But yeah, I mean, I had. Had my goggles break, had my goggles fall on on my on my uh, on my uh, mouth, and I couldn't breathe. I was always I I always finished the race. I never quit. And, uh, yeah. Brian likes to know what kind of goggles people wear. What kind of goggles you wore? 
I I love swans. I honestly, once I try swans, I never went anywhere else. I don't even know that I've ever heard of swans. <laughs> I've never heard of swans. Sorry, Ron, have you heard of swans? <laughs> no idea. And I'm, older you know? you. I'm older than you. I should know that stuff. <laughs> it's, I think it's Japanese. I'm not sure. I don't know anything about it. And clear, clear. I always wanted a clear. Ah, oh, the clears. Yeah, a lot of people are creeped out by the clears. No, no, I did. I did Swedes. I did Swedes oh, okay. in uh, in the beginning, but then I tried Swans, and I went with Swans all the, all the way. Wow. Yeah, I was a big fan of clear goggles too. Yeah, clear. The only way to go is clear, man, because that that's when you're able to see everything. Yeah. yeah. And the kind and the kind of swim cap you wore made a difference to you, didn't it? Um, oh, whatever, whichever was lucky. <laughs> what happened in 04? That's what happened in 04. Cause that's epic, man. Uh, well, in 04, basically, we come to the, as always, Croatian Swimming Federation got the shittiest equipment ever. <laughs> so we, we come well, to the. We, had it worse, we, Trinidad had it worse, but go ahead. Oh, no, man. We, we come to Olympics, and these people that swam on the first day, all of them had broken caps and broken suits that federation gave it to them so i said no man i'm not gonna allow that to happen to me i don't want to have my my cab just burst in the, in the middle of the race so i said okay i want i want a title that year in my cal's cap and mike mike sees me wearing a cal cap and he's like you're gonna swim in that and i'm like yeah he's like give it to me and i give it to him and he takes it and he writes uh times of all my races that i'm gonna do and i, I did it pretty much all, all the times that he wrote so uh yeah. it's framed is this framed at home this is the only swim cab that is framed <laughs> that's pretty freaking rad that's yeah cool. and, and they wanted to dq me actually for it american so, uh, american team actually put a com uh, put a complaint and they wanted to dq me after a hundred free final and the Olympic people, the Olympic committee people came up to me and they said, listen, they, they filed a complaint. You cannot swim in your university cap because you got to swim in your national cap. And I said, well, did you DQ me? And they're like, no, we did not DQ you. I'm like, if you did not DQ me now, you're not going to be able to DQ me till the rest of the Olympics. Right. And they And I continued swimming in it. And then they made it official after that Olympic. They made it official that you cannot come out. Unless... Was Mike was Mike your coach or George just coach in 04? My coach. He's your coach. And 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 he so he put aside his professional allegiance and he was just like, This is what's best for the swimmer. I'm just gonna support you. And he now he supported you, but he encouraged you. With, I mean, that says that speaks volumes, right? Well, he wasn't he wasn't United States coach at that time. He was I, Croatia, Croatia yeah, coach. Yeah, which is which his allegiance should be to Croatia the way the Croatia had, but his allegiance was to you, the athlete, right? Yeah, that's that's one of the things that Mike separates Mike Bottom from the rest of the U.S. coaches. Uh, first of all, he always allowed us to be prepared for Europeans and World Championships, which not a lot of coaches do in the United States. They are all about their careers, of course, their contract with the school and what you're going to do through your contract with the school. So they don't really care are you going to win a medal for your country no mike wanted mike wanted us to do the best what we can do to give the most what we can do and on in europeans worlds whatever so he's a legend yeah it's, it's different i mean i was recruited by a lot of coaches and was talking to a lot of coaches actually mark schubert was one that wanted me the most i was like spend two hours a week talking to, to the guy but if I went to train with Mark Schubert, I would do one week and be out of there. <laughs> I think that was a violation. <laughs> no, it's just it's just approach approach to the athlete, approach to 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 work out. You know, I, I don't I don't like the coaches that you know come with a whip on a workout. I, I I can't do that. You got to explain to me why am I doing this? If you don't explain it to me, if there's no sense for me to do that, yeah. I'm I'm bailing. I'm going somewhere else. Yeah. Well, that's what made you an elite swimmer is because you knew what you needed and or one of the many things that would have contributed to your success. And it, 
so happened that you you made the choice and got paired up with the coach that were you were to Yeah, no, of right. course. I mean, there's listen. There's different approaches. Of course, I, I I can't say that one approach is better than the other, or that you know somebody smarter or better than the other. Of course not. You yeah. know, if, you know, I can't train like Ryan Lochte or you know whoever. So everybody got to do what what they got to do and what's going to make them better. Yeah. But you got to believe what you're doing. You got to believe that that's going to help you, that you, you're going to get better off of it. Because if, if you don't believe and you're just going through the motions, it's better to go home. That's great. Do I got some rapid fire questions to ask you? Sure. What's the hardest race in swimming? I would say 400 I am. No, you're supposed to say 50 free. <laughs> uh, uh, that's that. That's the fastest and more, more, most interesting. But try, try training for 400. I am. <laughs> Just once, I need a sprinter to say 50 free. Shout out, Nathan. Hey, uh, are, uh, are sprinters tougher than distance swimmers? What? Are sprinters <laughs> tougher than distance swimmers? <laughs> I I couldn't hear. It. Did what? <laughs> How long was your meat warm up? Uh, probably the longest hour and a half to two hours because I had yoga, I had stretching, I had a lot of different stuff different than anybody else. Wow. Huh. What's the key to going your fastest time in the final? Just, just say fuck it. Spending enough time in the US, what's the most American thing about you? My accent? Usually when I go outside the U.S. and start talking in English like this, people look at me like, you're an American. <laughs> uh, when Popov went on three-hour walks, do you think he had his goggles on? <laughs> no, he had his wife next to him. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the greatest sprinter in Cal history? I'll say Tony. Just because he did what he, uh, maybe Matt Biondi. Matt Biondi also did what nobody else did in history, and so did Tony. Respect your elders. Who's the better dancer, you or Mike? <laughs> Mike. Because <laughs> he can slow dance, I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> With each other. Yeah. <laughs> what, impact, what impact do you think that your career had on swimmers today? I don't know. Maybe some. Maybe some back home. Maybe not. Uh, I don't really think about it, to be honest. I think everybody's story for himself. And I, I've been, you know, there's a lot of people that ask me, "Oh, did you get an autograph from Popoff when you swam against him or with Peter?" Because when I was like 18, I was uh, third, and they were first and second at the Europeans and stuff like that. And I always said, like, no, I wouldn't. I would if I meet. If I meet Michael Jordan tomorrow, I would. I actually met Kobe Bryant. I met LeBron. I would never ask an autograph. Why? You know, you, you have your own story. I would rather spend my time talking or whatsoever, whatever. You know, you know, joking with them than asking, "Hey, listen, can I get a picture or autograph so I can show somebody or post it on my social media?" No, I don't. it's stupid. Not to mention that I want to raise those guys, not not admire, yeah, not admire them. So it's it's just different approach, you know. If you approach it like that, how am I going to influence somebody or who's going to influence me? You're limited. You're in the box right away. Yeah, yeah. My, I'll I'll, I'll share that. I think that you may not know the impact that you have on other people, though, because. I got to race against you on the college level and at the, and internationally, and I saw the way that you carried yourself. The way, the fact that you answered that question and just say "fuck it" is so appropriate because you could see that from the outside watching somebody who. I mean, I, I saw Fred go eighteen seven, and then you and him go head to head in the in the two thousand five NCAA final. And I wouldn't have been surprised if if you won that race. He was my teammate, but it was it was really close, right? And like you were the kind of guy who showed up um, and just would wreak havoc on on a heat. And you might slip under the radar, but absolutely light it up. And you were doing it your own way in a different way. You were built differently. You swam differently. And 
um, you know, I wasn't ever on a team with you, but I, but I, I, I watched you and, you know, you're a couple years older than me. So that was impactful in, in me and seeing what does it look like for people that are winning NCAAs who are winning world championships. And, um, you know, and so that's the kind of thing that as a swimmer who's younger watching the older swimmers and what they're doing or the ones who are winning, um, you're always thinking about what, what is it that they're doing well? How do they carry themselves and what are they focusing on? And so, um, I mean, I can just say that I've been able to watch you and the successes that you've had and that made an impact on me and my swimming career. I don't want your autograph, but it's super yeah. cool talk to you and get to know like who you are as a person and what you what you thought about during that part of your life yeah i mean it's 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 my approach is definitely different you asked me about a warm-up i've never seen anybody do warm-up like i did but i've seen a lot of people copy it afterwards so hmm. i think i i impacted that way i i my a lot of people from europe would film my warm-up just because it was so unique because i would start with yoga half an hour yoga half an hour stretching then half an hour warm-up than half an hour preparation before the race. And I would always swim in a, in a lane. So I was, I was method, I had method to it. So I, I, everything was done for a reason. I was not, I was maybe slacking in preparation like three months or six months ahead of the race. But when it came to the race and that day, I was like point on. And that was one good thing about Cal because Mike Bottom and North Orton allow all of us to do whatever worked for us. It was not a team thing that you had to do something like everybody else. No, you did whatever worked for you best. And that, that, I think that approach, especially in swimming, that is individual sport is the best, you know? Dewey, I, that's empathy. And, um, and that's why I see you. Uh, John and Brian and I did a clinic in Trinidad last year, and I guarantee you, if I mention Dudragania to the kids who are at clinic who are 18, they were eight when you did, you get a clinic for them, and they remember that time. I guarantee you, if you go to Uganda right now, how many years later? Seven years later, the kid, there's some kid there who, who who's now swimming because yeah. you help them teach a swim or what have you, or you rose money for malaria. There, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a good story about Uganda behind the scenes. So there was this, this Indian family is the wealthiest family in Uganda. And they organized this, this meet, right? Uh, this clinic. And they invite George and me and all the proceedings go to fight malaria. And we didn't take any money. So we come there. And after, after the, the, oh, everything was over, they invited us to play poker with some other Indian, wealthy Indians, right? So me and George come there and... I have no money to enter the poker tournament and George doesn't know how to play. So he, he loans me like hundred bucks to, to play poker. <laughs> <laughs> By the end of the night, I clean them all out. And George, <laughs> George, George is pushing me and he's like, dude, man, they, they like paid for our trip. They put, they, they're like rich people. Don't clean them out. Don't clean them out. <laughs> So, so we go to we go to a club afterwards, and I'm like spinning rounds and we're spending money. So it was it was really funny that that poker game was one of the funniest things that ever happened because all of them all of them are like heavy hitters, you know, with a lot of money. They came in, they want to play poker, and I'm like nobody. I'm like pretending I don't know how to play poker. George is like there, just wondering what's going on and i'm like winning 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 i'm gonna go with you to vegas dude i'm gonna take you and george to vegas the wide-eyed not going guy and a yeah. quiet creation we make, we make a killing yeah i actually i just won last time i was there <laughs> don't ask me but yeah oh oh man <laughs> well uh, dude it's been a ton of fun so i think it's a good place to wrap it thanks thanks for joining us it's good to hang out uh that's it for this episode we'll be back tomorrow with leah martindale stancil at 6 p.m. Pacific. Yeah. So come on in for that. And uh, cheers, dude. It's been fun hanging out. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.